first I want to thank the uh, Studio School for inviting me to be part of their spring lecture series, hardly spring, and uh, <laughs> for helping me to prepare this evening's talk. And thank you all for coming. The title of my talk is The Right Color. Mark Rothko said that an expression of beauty was an expression of rightness, which of course ties in with my idea of the right color. Looking for the right color is searching for the next color in a composition so that all the shapes of the painting coexist successfully while each carries its load in the composition. In his six volume book, A la Recharge du Temps Perdu, which has been an ongoing influence, Marcel Proust was searching for lost time. Much of my life as a painter has been spent searching for colors which will harmoniously work together to create what Hans Hoffman called a color world. And here's Emerson writing on color, quote, thus inevitably does the universe wear our color. As I am, so I see, unquote. Here I am at age 16, painting in an art class. You can see my influences, Pontalism, Impressionism, and Medigliani. This painting, Medigliani was shown everywhere um, during that period. This painting started my career as the picture won first prize in the National Scholastic Art Award and was shown at the New York Coliseum. After I graduated with a master's degree from Hunter College in 1968, I started working on a series of paintings based on logarithmic progressions. These progressions, when plotted on a two-dimensional surface, create curved lines. I worked on the curves mathematically with a slide rule and then drew them onto the canvas. The painting was a layer of diluted acrylic. I did several paintings like this at my first studio on East 90th Street. By loosening up the curves, I moved into my first wave paintings of 1969. Here are three images. This is spiked red. Uh, these were one-shot paintings. If they didn't work, they had to be thrown out. You really couldn't paint on them again and retain the freshness. I was influenced by the ideas from the book Zen and the Art of Archery by Eugene Harrigal when I did these. The writer talks about motor learning and control for any physical activity, including hitting your target. And these paintings were like that. Either you hit it or you blew it. In which case, as I said, the painting was discarded. The notion of error was built into the process. Some of these were shown in my first solo exhibition in 1970 at Andre Emmer Gallery. When I made these pictures, although the colors were only moving laterally, I had to quickly arrive at the next right color while the paint was still wet. I sponged acrylic paint onto a wet canvas. It was a watercolor technique. Usually, I saw the next color in my mind and my conscious job was to mix it. Here, the image is getting as blurred and amorphous as possible. As you can see, I had, between 1969 and 1970, loosened the structure and allowed the sponged wet acrylic to have more play. The edges were my tribute to Pollock. Regarding these pictures, here's what I wrote in a memoir from 1980, quote, 
I got a studio on 11th Street. I loved going down there. I would stop at Chock Full of Nuts and get two coffees to go. <laughs> the paintings from the night before would be lying on the floor. I'd climb on top of the ladder and look down at them. I remember the smell and the feel of the canvas. I had never been happier. I'd see how the paintings looked, whether I'd been on or off the day before. Then I'd hang them up on the wall and see how they looked up. Then I'd tack some new canvas onto the floor and start working. The canvas would be blank, just like a big piece of white paper on the floor. I'd sponge the whole thing down with water. Then I'd start pouring color onto the canvas. I had these wonderful silk sponges of different sizes that I'd collected. I'd dance, I'd play, I'd rub. This is an image of a painting that I did with oil paint using the same kind of structure as the pictures we were just looking at. I'd been trained in oil from the age of seven, and although acrylic was the hot new thing in graduate school and had some wonderful properties, especially for staining, that is, painting on unprepared cotton duck, I couldn't quite get oil out of my system and went back and forth for a while, as you'll see, before I finally settled on oil in the 80s. This is a very big painting, as you can see, 183 inches. <clears throat> Here, I've moved back to acrylic and a painting based on a grid format. At the time, I suddenly had a strong instinct to work with this structure and went with it. Later, I discovered that other painters, Richter and Bartlett, for example, unbeknownst to me, were working with grids at the same time. And here I was drawing into the grid with varying sized strips of masking tape, quarter inch, half inch, three quarter inch. The different size strips made different kinds of lines on the painting. This painting is based on the palette of boating by Manet at the Met from 1874, painted 101 years before my canvas. I am especially fond of the light green blue sea color in the, in the Manet, uh, and there I am with my version of it. This, um, I hope I don't trip. You know, these kinds of colors. This came out of a small watercolor study. I would do several watercolor studies and then pick one that I thought promising. The large paintings were done on the floor and stretched afterwards, giving me some play on the edge. I would duplicate each color from the watercolor in acrylic and then pour the paint into numbered jars, in this case, 144. The paint was sponged and brushed onto the canvas, 10 or more layers of each color, in an attempt to create a blurred, velvety effect. This is the last painting of mine that my father saw. What he said about it was, quote, to me, it looks like dancing, unquote. I'm showing you a few images from the early 80s. In general, the Reagan years, the 80s, was not my favorite decade. <laughs> this is owned by Ezra Levin, who's in the audience tonight. This and the next two images <clears throat> are of oil paintings in which I was clearly working with an enclosing border. Something Tony Smith had discussed at Hunter was the difference between enclosed space and slice of life. And this has been an ongoing concern in my paintings. Degas is a master of slice of life, cropping images at the edge, giving the illusion that the picture is a piece of a larger whole. While Ken Nolan's targets are examples of enclosed, even Rothko's paintings can be viewed as enclosed space. 
A stated border with a more extended image is one of the things I'm working with here. Smith said he preferred enclosed space because it clearly showed that the artist had made the decision about exactly where the painting ended. However, one of the dangers of listening to your professor is that, as in this case, he did not practice what he preached. Several of his paintings are slice of life. I used an electric sander in the painting, an idea I got from Smith's treatment of his Cubai sculptures. As you can see in this yellowish painting, I am moving back to a more structured image similar to the mid-70s pictures. This was close to the kind of drawings I did at the time. This is an asymmetrical, irregular grid, grid-like picture. <clears throat> the title refers to my mother as a memory of her early years, painted after she died in 1989. The CG in the title refers to the art critic Clement Greenberg, and the painting came out of discussions he and I had about Titian's use of alizarin crimson, also called magenta red purple, several names for this color. There had been a show of Titian's work at the National Gallery in Washington, I think it was 1990, that Greenberg and I had both seen. This is a painting where the ideas of nuance and close value color become the subject. Close value color, as many of you know, is staying within the range of one particular color rather than working with contrast or up and down the tonal scale. The actual word nuance means a subtle distinction or variation, which expresses one of the things I was attempting here. I was interested in emphasizing small differences between colors. So this is a little hard to see. Uh, <clears throat> the sizes are from point to point on the diamonds. The painting takes its title from a 1961 poem by Sylvia Plath. This is the first diamond-shaped canvas I am showing you. Throughout the 90s, I worked with this structure because I thought it activated the small rectangles of color more than a square orientation would, although I worked on the canvas in every direction when I was painting. I also connected with the diamond-shaped canvases of Mondrian. This picture started with a lavender underpainting that can be slightly seen in the actual canvas in the same way that Chardin's black grounds inform the top layer of color in his late still lives. The painting also makes a reference back to For Leslie that I just showed you, but this time I'm working with oil. This was made in Paris. I was covered in stains of brown when I went to the neighborhood cafe for a coffee. <clears throat> this is a larger version, which was then painted in New York. I chose to work with the color brown because it was the color I liked least, the color I'd always avoided. I wanted to see what I could find out about it. Throughout the 90s, I continued with these close value color paintings, which were made with so many layers of oil paint applied with a palette knife that the edges where the small rectangles met became ridged and were an important element in the total image, that is the ridged edges. <clears throat> the last color I tackled was black along with yellow, often considered to be the most difficult. 
One of the reasons for this is that the black pigments are made with coarser granules than other colors, causing the variety of blacks to sink into the layers beneath, which can dull the surface. I had to work with this limitation, coddling the blacks along, sometimes coating them with varnish. Mars, ivory, peach, lamp, bone were the greater part of my expressive cachet for about five years. For me, putting one black next to another started to take on the illusion of using all colors. For example, I could make Mars black look almost red if I put it next to ivory. Payne's gray looked like light blue next to lamp black, and lamp black looked almost warm next to ivory. It was, I imagine, similar to composing for one instrument if you are a composer. And that is what the composer, Theodore Whipward, who is here tonight, Ted? It's my corny. <laughs> Thank you. Ted composed a three part percussion piece after the last three paintings of this series called Dark Love after this canvas. Here's something Ted wrote for the playbill percussion performance, which had the paintings on view at the kitchen in Chelsea in 1999. Quote, and from the first time I saw them, I began thinking of how they might sound. Percussion would clearly be the medium of choice. This is the third of the three-part painting series and the subject of the third movement of Whippard's composition. In 1998, I moved to a new studio in Chelsea, which starts the work of the last 10 years. The title here is Are You Here? And it refers to a friend who had died the year before. I wondered if his spirit were in my new studio. In this painting, I am working with what I'd learned using blacks in the reproductions of paintings we just looked at while, while using an abstract expressionist paint handling. The structured rectilinear format relates to many of my other pictures. The masking tape that was on while I was working stayed on in the end because I thought it added to the picture. One of the things I was experimenting with here was the thinness and thickness of the rectilinear shapes. These are among the pictures in my first exhibition at Chelsea at Elizabeth Harris Gallery in 1999. This painting was done on an orange ground, and the underpainting comes through in places, particularly between the lines. When I finished it, I identified what I had created as the feeling in my mother's dining room. Starting in 1990, I made several trips to Paris and the surrounding areas because I'd become interested in early Gothic French cathedrals and stained glass windows. I'd read a lot about Bourges Cathedral and then finally visited in 2000. This painting continues my interest in the windows, although I realize the theme might read as American, because the predominant colors in the, in the stained glass at Saint-Chapelle, Chart, and others is red and blue. This is a painting about off-whites and blues, quote, which are distant from a preconceived notion of blueness, unquote, as one critic put it. Also, as the title suggests, the attempt here is to see what happens if none of the blues touch or invade each other. Around this time, I started making the paint myself from pigment and linseed oil. Here, the red half columns do invade each other. In addition to the experiment with structure, the painting continues my interest in both close value color and red and blue, with seven different reds, six off whites, 
and four blues. For a long time, I had been influenced by Bach's music, and Ken Johnson picked up on this in a review of my 2003 exhibition. Quote, the effect is polyrhythmic in three dimensions, unquote. And also, quote, Miss Lipsky's compositions distantly resemble piano keyboards, enhancing the feeling of Bach-like musicality. In 2004, I first became aware of the extent to which my reading of Proust was influencing my painting when I began work on a group of nine canvases that circulated versions of four colors in nine locations on the canvas. While applying red paint to the first canvas in the series, the tune from the song Red River Valley suddenly came to mind and with it, a world forgotten for many years, centered on playing the piano and singing folk songs with my family as a child. The particular color of red on my palette opened these memories, resulting in an experience that Proust describes as involuntary memory. As a testament to the experience, I call the series Red River Valley. Each of the nine paintings has a white border because each painting came from a small colored study on white paper. The surfaces now are smooth. There is no interference in the paint handling. I had learned a great deal from studying early Netherlandish paintings in Bruges, Ghent, Brussels, and Paris. The four colors were variations on red, blue, black, and white. I thought it would be interesting to see what effect, if any, location had on the way the colors read. There were only nine permutations possible, hence nine paintings to the series. What I discovered was that each color could work in each of the nine locations if I got its modulation right. That is, if it were the right variation of the color. As Clement Greenberg said, any painting can work if the color is good enough. Here you can see I'd switched the outer red half columns to the shorter position and inverted the colors in the middle column. The sizes of each of the nine canvases vary slightly, as do all the internal proportions. Here, the red has moved to the top larger panels, which are unequal in size. The red touches off the off-whites below at slightly different levels. That is, the paintings are asymmetrical, another model for this being the human face. This was done after the show to see what the image would be like without the border. Based on this canvas, despite, despite Tony Smith's early advice, I decided that the border was not necessary in future paintings. <clears throat> this painting was done in two phases, the left side in 2003 and the right in 2008. The left side, a separate painting, had been sent to Bosnia by the State Department. And when it came back, I thought that I could make a better picture if I repeated the image in a second canvas with the exact same structure and colors, but this time with the bars going in the opposite direction. This then became one image. I'm going to diverge from my abstract paintings for a moment to show you a series of gouaches on paper that I did from stained glass scenes. There are usually 10 or 12 of these small scenes in any given large 13th and 12th century French window. These were seen on my trips to Troyes, Le Mans, Poitiers, Chartres, Bourges, Saint, Cluny, and even at the Louvre between 2000 and 2004. And this is an installation shot from the Cathedral of St. John the Divine where 80 of the vitro paintings were shown in 2006. 
I would spend the day at the cathedral drawing the scenes that interested me and writing down the colors. Then when I got back to the apartment where I was staying in Paris, I would paint the gouaches from the drawings and colored notations I just made. Bourges has windows lower than those of other cathedrals, so they were easier to see. The black line down the middle of this work reminded me of a Mac, Back, Max, Max Beckman diptych. In the original, the line is actually lead that is holding the two panels of glass together. This image is very meta insofar as it is art referring to art a picture of sculptors making a sculpture on the lower right and left, and two stonemasons building a gate in the middle. The Sylvester window must have been paid for by the Stonemasons Guild, so this scene is a medieval advertisement. I was very interested in the flowery decorations around the central images, which are called the mosaic. They reminded me of patterns in Matisse, and I was sure he had seen them. I was surprised then to learn when I read Hilary Sperling's biography of Matisse that he didn't seem particularly aware of French glass. This is one of the earliest scenes I worked from right in Paris at Saint-Chapelle. Most of the other cathedrals were within a two-hour radius of Paris. The slight mountains in the upper section reminded me of Calm Lux a Volupte. I loved the idea of a bad, rich window. Although the rich, I have to say, always seemed more lively in these scenes. The good people were kind of boring and usually dressed in white. I was taken by this particular image of the leper with the dogs at his feet. And I have to admit that my first thought was not of art, but of a Lenny Bruce joke about lepers walking down Fifth Avenue. I also enjoyed the left side brickwork, which made me think of a Nolan. The upper section in this, in this image reminded me of a Paul Clay, the abstracted image at the top. To my eye, the figure of Mary at the bottom was a dead ringer for a Balthus. A slightly different version of the same subject is at Louvre Notre Dame de Strasbourg. So I ended up doing two pictures with the same image of Mary wiping uh, Christ's feet with her hair. I loved the charming woman in red stockings on a divan circa 1300, trying to seduce the would-be saint, Philetus, who at the very last moment is saved by God. This is the second image from the Tree of Jesse window at Troyes, and it reminded me of Chagall's Fiddler. What I wrote about these in a statement from 2001 was, quote, they tap into a purer self, a childlike self, that would have been charmed by these beautiful colored vitro, unquote. They are both kaleidoscopic and very theatrical, not like my abstract paintings. So that's another view of me working on the preparation. I had thought these anonymous painters were the original French fauve artists that they showed extraordinary skill in high key color. I wasn't interested in the stories at first. I looked at the windows the way I look at abstract paintings. I began to read about their meanings only later. In a way, the whole assignment that I gave myself was an excuse for basking in the beauty of the early glass. This statement from a Roman Antonius seems to sum up the medieval idea too, quote, if the picture is good enough, who cares who made it?" Unquote. I'm going to show you some works on paper and prints. This study is typical of my abstract paintings on paper. 
casual and rougher than my work on canvas, almost like taking notes or a diary. This etching was made by painting tar on the individual plates where the color was going to be, giving the surface of the print a quality similar to that of layered oil painting. Porphyry, as some of you know, is the name of a red-purple stone that the columns at St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice are made from. Not all of the columns, some of the columns. I tried to simulate the color in this etching. The first plate of the print had the reddish color everywhere that you see it, and also under the blacks. This comes out of a painting of mine with the same title from 2002. I did the large painting first and then went back to the image in the monotype. Manet often made prints of his paintings after the fact, which is where I got the idea. The Lincoln Center print is a 16 color silkscreen that is from a drawing I did of upside down piano keys. I decided to confront piano key uh, reference head on here. Sometimes I like to remember what it feels like to let my hand show. In my paintings of the last several years, I've specifically been dealing with the whole, flat, non-hierarchical plane. In that sense, in addition to being synoptic, these paintings are democratic. It's not a new idea. Here's a statement from Augustine from his book of De Musica, 389 AD. Quote, the higher things are those in which Equality resides, supreme, unshaken, unchangeable, eternal. End quote. This is Percy and Randall. When a painting succeeds, nothing dominates, nothing fixes too quickly, nothing settles. This allows for different readings, the flat surface doesn't impose a figure ground relationship. One hopes that each shape connects with its color, as the proportions and colors have to be convincing for the painting to succeed. A three-part painting that was done on three separate walls of my studio. I was circulating colors as I had in the Red River Valley series, but here there is no limit to the number of colors how it has changed. One of the ideas I have been focusing on in the last few years is the notion that there are many more colors than are named in our English vocabulary. I call these no-name colors, one that's, ones that defy naming and unfortunately often reproduction. These painters feature small differences that become important like the earlier series, they are not symmetrical. They are built up with countless layers that become, in effect, the history of how hard it is to get the right color. When Titian was asked how he achieved the quality of his work, he said, quote, 30, 40 blazes. First, writing about the sea had this terrifying insight. Quote, I never saw the same sea twice. Unquote. The sea itself looks different depending on the sky, the light, the time of day. I was thinking about that when I painted this picture and also about how color too changes depending upon what is next to it. And like the sea, it's almost impossible to get the same color twice. The largest number of metaphors in Proust's six-volume work are about the sea, which obviously influenced this title. This title refers to Ang's 
burlesque in Versailles, 1824 to 34, at the Metropolitan Museum. Because of its mastery of close value off whites, I had admired the act for many years, and it was a take off point for this painting. This is a reference to the rich colors I had seen in Bellini's work on several trips to Venice. In the installation shot we saw before from 2006, <clears throat> the red bars were at the top. Dare I go back? In 2008, the painting was in a group show, and I decided that the orientation with the red at the bottom worked better. To get closer to the surfaces of the mission painting, I started to add mica dust to the paint, the closest thing we have to pulverized glass that the Venetian has used. The last images I'm going to show you are done after the 2006 show. Cobalt. The title refers to the blue of the outer columns, which because of the nature of the pigment cobalt had to be painted over and over to get the color smooth. Perhaps you saw it last summer at the National Academy Museum. This was done at the same time as cobalt. The edges between the shapes are continuously rubbed with cotton-tipped applicators so that they read as soft, not hard. I was interested in blurred, soft edges even in the early abstract papers when I used sponges to get Effect. A small picture that took place over a three year period. It's named for a character in T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Quote If you see dear Mrs. Eckerton, tell her I bring the horoscope myself. One must be so careful these days. I worked on this small picture for so long. I thought I was Mrs. Eckerton. <laughs> the painting was influenced by the color in Blind Orient, Searching for the Rising Sun by Poussin and the Neck. The date refers to the day one of my great grandmothers arrived in the United States. The year is 1903. I discovered this when my cousin Seth, who's right over there, Seth. Seth. Yes! Seth actually looked through thousands of, of pages from Ellis Island and found our great grandmother's entry into the United States, and I thought that really deserved the title of it. This painting is the same size. Poussin's landscape for the column, 1651, from the day that I admired the Poussin and Asian show in that class. I drew the painting at the exhibit and walked out the composition based on what I saw as the divisions of the landscape. Although structure is important in my painting, the leading element has always been the color. As with beauty, last 30 or so years, the importance of color has diminished in the old world, as if the painting didn't have to do with colored stuff called paint. But then the painting itself has diminished, as we've seen in so many Whitney Biennials and galleries around Chelsea, although not here in the studios. When I first started painting, I was inspired by Rothko Hoffman, Lewis, Nolan, all colorists, all coming out of the work of Matisse. Where are their equals now? At the same time, you've probably noticed that there has been a devaluation of beauty. This was perhaps first stated in print by Robert Hughes in Time Magazine, 1986, in his famous pan in Mars Lewis retrospective which ended with this question, quote, that is beauty enough. For 
over 500 years, beauty had been forgotten. Now, Hughes wondered. The showman trickster, Marcel Duchamp, who said he hated art and museums, preferred chess and Greek, considered the shovel art, to my mind, the perfect object with which to handle his work. First, Christ stated this question. When I respond to a Titian, Bellini, Rembrandt, or Powell, it's the beauty, the expression of brightness, as Rothko put it, and that I open my talk with, that is responsive. And that's what I have the audacity to use the word made popular thought by our new president to attempt in my own work. For me, that is 